um, what we often hear about literature is how complicated literature is, right? That it allows you to enter into it and wrestle with the characters and very, you know, a novel is not terribly good if the character has no texture, no humanity. If it's just this hero figure who never does anything wrong and nothing can touch them and so forth and so on, that's usually not very engaging for us because we can't relate to such a figure. Well, that's my argument is that, that what we find in the Hebrew literature is, is relatable people, um, true fumbling humanity. And, and there's value to be engaging in that. Any other thoughts or comments? Well, and for recording, that was just a, um, a recap of where we're going to be in terms of, of um, this, this course. But we're going to start today. Um, in this, this one will actually be a little bit different, but it is an example of how to read more carefully and maybe in a way that we haven't done before, texts that we think we're so uh, well aware of. Um, so we're going to start at creation. By the way, these next several images um, are from the Holcomb Bible. Uh, which is from the 14th century. If you go to the, uh, if you like this sort of stuff, uh, illuminated manuscripts, the, um, the British uh, Museum has made all of them available. You can search by keywords and things, and, and you get some very funny images, by the way. <laughs> all right. So we've got the story of creation. We're going to skip over the beginning. We're going to focus on humanity. And God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. First of all, um, <clears throat> just a couple of things. I'm going to use the New Revised Standard Version because that's what most of us have and know nowadays. Uh, but it is, uh, we have to um, be a little honest with our translation. It should say, let us make Adam man. So it's the masculine there um, in our image. But it is also the plural, let us. So what does it mean to be made in the image of God according to our likeness? And again, feel free to type questions in as well if you don't want to come off mic or on mic, I guess. Well, from the even the readings today in church, the Genesis before this, I've always thought that we were made in goodness to glorify him. Mm. You didn't grow up a Presbyterian by any chance, did you? No, I'm a <laughs> cradle Episcopalian. Well, the old, uh, the old Westminster Catechism has, uh, for what were we made uh, to uh, glorify God and all his goodness. And, and to restore because okay. I, I guess, I mean, in the beginning, all was good, but we know, like you've just said, that we're not good. So to me, it's why are we here is to restore. And with everything that's going on, God is about new life to me, Jesus. Yes. And so, uh, yeah, so that's, that's what I read into that. So excellent, Anne, I agree with you. But let's, for the moment, step into this moment of creation. Um, and I've been struck, by the way, how much this week um, Christian writers and Jewish writers have talked about being made in the image of God, and, and I think our conversation actually will be really relevant. Um, but so in this moment, before we get to the fall, in fact, we're not going to deal with it here other than as you bring it up in conversation, which is fine. If if nothing untoward happens, being made in the image of God, what does that mean? So Anne said goodness, right? We're assuming God is good and just. One interpretation that's been set forward is that being made in God's image is like an emperor sending a, 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 an emissary to another place to rule over it in his image. Excellent. So, I mean that we are put here to... Uh, take care of the earth in the same way that God would. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. And it, it's, um, so the idea that, um, you know, when the emissary comes from the king, 
Um, and in fact, the Hebrew term there is messenger, malach, which is what we get angel. Um, they are, it's as good as God being there, and quick little Hebrew uh, narrative thing for you. That's why you will find in like the Abraham narrative, when it says the Lord spoke to Abraham, it will alternate at times between the Lord spoke to Abraham and the angel said, because it's one and the same. Um, Marcy, you raised your hand. Go ahead. I didn't mean to, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but Ka Cassie does have a question here. I remember when Henry talked about how the incarnation of Jesus was to place God into the shape of a human. Uh, and that's, of course, literally what incarnation means. But I think the reverse is true, she says, that we were made to accept a, a God being. Do you mean like a being of God or becoming God? Okay. Well, it, it's, um, I think one of the important things within the text, so this is where we're doing what call close reading. This is my, my thing, and I hope I don't irritate you all too much with it. But notice what it says here. Um, I'll skip the plural for a moment, only because we don't have a good answer for it, really. But it's according in our image, according to our likeness. So let's start with the fact that Scripture is saying here, we are not God, but we are supposed to resemble God in some deep way. So to Max's point, that analogy, that emissary has the authority of the king, right? Or the, or, or the queen, for that matter. The emissary has that authority that, that they are not the king themselves or the emperor uh, or empress, but they do have all of the trappings thereof authoritarily. Um, okay, so in being God, being in us. Thank you, Cassie. Let's, let's come, come to that. So there's the, the image aspect, the likeness of it. Um, and so Cassie is clarifying for us that except God being in us. Yeah, there's, there's a sense in which too, I think, Paul talks about how now that Christ not simply has come, but has risen and sent the Holy Spirit, Pentecost, that now we're able to get towards a Garden of Eden state. I think it's in Corinthians. Paul talks about, yeah, 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 this is the world. It's a fallen and broken world that we live in. But now there should be neither Greek nor Jew, slave nor free, male nor female. We've dealt with that for years, for, for millennia, Paul says, but that's not how we were created to begin with. We were to be literally in the garden with God, walking with God. Um, and, and now God is in us in that sense. So the, par the passage here though, goes on to say at least something of what it means to be in the image of God. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over the wild things of animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So hold that. We're going to come back to that dominion aspect. <clears throat> now, obviously, um, this image here is, uh, is actually from Genesis 2. We, we've got a, um, two descriptions of the creation of humanity, which we can talk about if you like, but I'm focusing on Genesis 1 for the moment. So God created, remember here, it should, it's the singular Adam. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them, Oto. So the Hebrew, I actually corrected the second line. I forgot to correct the, the first line. This is, and the reason I really emphasize this, I'm, I'm a strong believer in um, broadening um, and in, in, using inclusive language where we can. But I think it's vital that we understand here what's, what's being said in the Hebrew. So God created Adam, man, Humanity works, sort of, in his image. But the point is, it's a singular notion. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created. And then in Hebrew, it becomes the plural, them. So being created in the image of God means what? Well, it, I'm not alone. 
I, as a man, do not make the image of God on my own, do I? Or Anne as a woman, right? Male and female, that's what's needed for the image of God. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Um, what's the consequence of that awareness? First of all, what does it tell us about God? Yeah, Cassie. I was going to say that um, there are capacities in different people that I don't think any of us have a capacity that God doesn't have. So the act of creation is a male and a female act. So there's, there are powers that belong to us in, in creation that are godlike, right? Not God, but but the act of creating, I think, is a part of the image of God. And that is a, a unified experience of, of not just a one, one creature. Yeah, excellent, excellent point. And we're going to come to that at the very end because that's an aspect. The creative <laughs> aspect is something that we have in our Episcopal Catechism that I think is really valuable. And um, we'll, we'll come to that. Dorothy L. Sayers uh, talks about that. And Father Brady, I, I think Cassie, <clears throat> Cassie said it very well. And I actually have a Bible who, which um, this one, it does have the Hebrew. Um, and I've always read that and I've never been threatened. I mean, I feel like what Cassie said, I've never been threatened that it's talking about in the, you know, gender source, a male. It's talking about men and women right and and it's and so what does that say then about how we understand the nature and character of god how do we visualize god then i mean the this is relevant conversation that we you know the church has been engaged in for for many decades there's elizabeth everybody say hello to elizabeth hello so, so um you know our god language there are many people understandably and reasonably who have had uh, you know because of negative experiences with men and perhaps their own father figures for example really wrestle and struggle with the um with the the male masculine imagery of god and we see it in this 14th century manuscript right there it's a dude with a beard right my hair is getting that long you know but right away right away the bible says yeah you know our language requires masculine and feminine nouns and suffixes and all the rest but god we approximate God, we, we have the likeness, we are the image of God only when, only in the sense that we are male and female pre present together. When we as an entity, as, as humanity as a whole, so God is not any particular gender, God is not any, um, any single person and so forth. It, it requires um, all of us, us as a community, us as a unity, uh, in order to even approximate God. So God is that much more, but then at the same time, it's a real emphasis upon our need, and this is to Cassie's point, uh, creatively um, and, and otherwise, that we were to, be, were to be together. And I'll skip back briefly to the, the trickiness of the, um, we'll come to dominion too, Marcy, but the, um, the let us make man, man uh, humankind, mankind. Um, we honestly don't know exactly what's going on. Plenty of Christians, of course, view that as uh, as a early allusion to the Trinity. Um, you know, as a historical literary scholar, it's a little bit anachronistic. On the other hand, there is this fluid sense um, that uh, Judaism has always had about. Um, uh, the, the notion, as I was just implying, you know, with angels representing God. And so it's as if you're talking to God. The Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. So there's always been within Scripture this sense of God operating in, um, shall we say, a multiplicity of ways. And of course, today is Trinity Sunday. And we affirm both the 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And yeah, we're not exactly sure how to make that work. By the way, my first ever sermon I was assigned to preach, Sunday I was assigned to preach, was Trinity Sunday. And I still don't know whether that bishop likes me or not. <laughs> <laughs> so any other thoughts on, on gender and the image of God and, and what the implications are there? I think that uh, in the sense that there is a, a multiplicity and kind of a, a fluidity, um, something big and hard to understand, I don't think it's possible to imagine that Adam was like the God lookalike, that like you know, beard, mustache, certain skin color, whatever. I don't think that any one person is a perfect reflection of God. And I think that um, no one woman is a perfect reflection of God. And I think that also points to the fact that all of us together can be a greater reflection because if God is this larger being uh, with which contains multitudes of beings like maybe i look like this little itty bitty part mm -hmm. of god yeah exactly right and that's that's the point that um it, it's a I mean, that's one of the most important things to me cassie as you're saying it's it's not it's not a denigration of you that you're not god um it's also not a diminution of God or a denuding of God or anything else to say God is not a masculine. It's, it's, it's the opposite. It's we are a part of God. We reflect something valuable. Um, one of my uh, Facebook friends this morning posted a quote from Oscar Romero saying, you know, when we harm or kill another person, we are harming killing God because they are the image of God. I mean, this is this is the power of what's there. Mm. Uh, sorry, guys, I keep I keep hitting the wrong thing and moving our slides. Sorry about that. Um, and so, yeah, um, Cassie, absolutely, very powerful, very powerful indeed. Um, so, good. Any other thoughts on? Oh, is there clarity of definition of image? Image is not replica, Marcy. It's a great point, right? It, I, the term image here. In Hebrew, uh, in, in our, in, and in our likeness, both of those terms are um, also used like when someone looks in water or a mirror and sees themselves, or when there's a painting or something of that nature. That's, that's what those, those Hebrew terms are used in those contexts as well. So the idea is that when, when you look, when we look at one another, on some level, we should be recognizing that there is, this is a reminder, this is, this is a reflection of God. This is a person who is part of and reflects the, part of, I'd be a little careful with that phrase, but, you know, when we, it's, it's like, I've got the icon of Jesus, the teacher I was given when I was ordained, looking at this, Almost everybody, at least within Christianity, would look at it and go, that's supposed to be Jesus, right? We have that general sense. We're not going to go, oh, that's Jesus. And so in, in that way, right, we all are reflecting God. I look at Cassie, I look at Misty, I look at Amy, and I go, there is God. It, they're not God, but they are the image of God. So let's come back then now. So that's really important. And that's actually the, the whole um, fatherhood image of God thing is actually something I'm really thinking a lot about and maybe writing on next. So, you know, in the coming months and years, please, uh, you know, engage with me on that. Um, the, uh, so then again, now what's then our responsibility? Because God says, let us make uh, humankind in our image and then immediately goes into that dominion. And, and Marcy said, dominion is such a tricky word. Let's start with that. Because that's the word that's there, to rule. What does that mean? Okay, so Cassie says, does it mean to, to rule or be better or more capable than? Well, I will say in Hebrew, let's just start with strictly there, it means to rule. But how does one rule? And whose rule are we, should we be concerned about in this moment? If we're trying to understand 
what it means to be in the image of God. In general, how, how do we understand God's rule? In general, and we all have our tough days, days when we feel that God is pretty despotic. Just look at Job, right? He, God gives us a lot of leeway, doesn't? Yeah, absolutely, Cassie. Um, but so, yes, and there's good improv training. God's rule is benevolent. That is, God's rule is to love us and care for us. Now, Genesis will go on to uh, imply, because it's never stated, that God loved us enough to give us freedom. That's the reason that tree is in there. I mean, the only thing that humanity, humanity could do anything they wanted but one thing. If that one negative wasn't there, were they truly ever free, right? So when we talk, I do not think we should shy away at all from this obligation that we are to have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and everything that lives. But having dominion is not the same as conquering. It's not oppression. It's rulership. And this again comes back to this question of, I should not think of my human father when I think of God in terms of fatherhood. In the same way, I shouldn't think of, of King George III or any pick or pick a really positive president or king that you think was one of the greatest humans to ever reign, Elizabeth's pretty darn good, they're only ever going to be a, a, a short approximation and could likely be a complete distortion of what God's reign looks like, God's sovereignty. So does that change at all how you think about this? I'm, I'm kind of curious, has anybody heard talks from or felt like in reading this passage in the past that you're like, I can't, I can't hold to this, this view of dominion. It's antiquated. It's inappropriate. Well, maybe it's just me because I've, I've heard those sermons before. Um, and, um, and I think that, I think the challenge is, thank you, Marcy. I, I think the challenge here is is to think in the godly terms, right? It, the, the, we are limited in terms of analogies and words, obviously by our humanity, but we always have to remind ourselves in thinking about God, gender doesn't apply. We use terms of dominion and rulership and so forth, and, and it's laid out here uh, that we're to have that kind of dominion, uh, but it's never the way we do it, right? We're gonna approximate in that, you know, coming back to Paul's comment in 1 Corinthians 1.10 that I said is so frustrating as he says to have the mind of Christ and to be in perfect unity and so forth and so on. Paul was a realist. I think Paul knew we were, you know, Paul certainly knew we were never going to do that perfectly. But I think what Paul was saying is if we don't set that as our target, if we don't set our goal to be perfect in that way, then we're never going to get close to it. So in the same way, how would God want us to care for creation? You know, in Genesis chapter 2, it tells us that God put the man in to keep and to guard Shomer, to guard the garden, to guard creation. That's not a destructive, that's not a dominion as conqueror, as Marcy wrote here. Um, and um, that is... That is not the imagery that we have from, from Genesis or, as Marcy points out, from the New Testament. The kingdom of God is one that judges, but the judgment is always for true justice. The kingdom of God is one where ruling is care and love and nurturing. It's guarding and protecting this creation that we've been given. It's not literally metaphorically pooping all over it right it's it's really protecting that was not a good image i apologize <laughs> but, <laughs> but i also think that we do have the capacity to hurt it and we obviously yes. have and i think that 
what we we were given the capacity to do that to 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 create the kind of environmental mess we were in and i think that um maybe it's just because i've been reading dune um by frank herbert again which i love total great environmental science fiction okay we've got to have a long conversation about that because i finally read it for the first time and less than impressed but go on we will come back to that (laughs) it's problematic but i love it um but at the end it has it has a line where he says only he who can destroy something truly truly rules it and I think that like we were genuinely given that that opportunity and what we did with it shows that. Exactly what? right, Cassie. I I couldn't agree more. And, and, and it's that, that go ahead. Well, and it's that freedom that God allowed us to have, like the tree, that yep. moves it from the good sense of rule to the wrong sense of rule. Absolutely. And, and so we've got the power. That's part of being in the image of God, to fill it, subdue it. Um, there, there is no question that there is a taming aspect, just as in the very first verse of the Bible, the world was tohu vavohu, formless and void, and God brought order to it. But that is order that allows life, not a crushing and destroying of something that already has life and order, if that makes sense. Um, It's interesting, I was reading a couple articles um, this morning about defunding the police, right? With the Black Lives Matter, some of them, some folks are really calling for defunding police, and I will admit, um, I I hear that, and I just think that's impractical. Um, I I look at human nature, and I think, "Mm, we don't, we don't, do well without some guardrails around us and so forth. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to read, I wanted to understand what, what was it they were really calling for. And, and, and it's, a, it's a spectrum, right? Some people are truly saying we shouldn't have police anymore. And it's interesting because those people, and I love their view, and I think it's a biblical view, is that if we as communities, the people next to one another, next to another, next to another, next to another, is looking out and caring for and enforcing in a communal way what is right and good, then we shouldn't have need for people to come in from outside to impose any sort of order on us, right? But then we do have human nature, so I'm struggling, so I'm still talking through, but I think, you know, that I, there is a utopian in this best sense, a, a, a good view and vision of the world where that would be possible. I mean, that, that's what's envisioned here in Genesis, is that we don't, we don't need those externalities. We don't need the law at this stage, right? And that's what the prophets say, and that Jesus then proclaims, and that Paul says has come, is that when that time comes, the law, says Jeremiah in 30-something, I'm amazed that I got that close to it, but Jeremiah says, no longer will the elders need to tell the younger, or the neighbor tell their neighbor, what God's law is, because it will be written in each of our hearts. And I, and I truly believe it is, we just don't read it. We don't pay attention to it. So Cassie and Marcia brought some other things that are actually in our catechism that I quite love. Uh, we just have a few minutes. In our catechism, it says, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? It means that we are free to make choices. Choices to love, to create, to reason, and to live in harmony with creation and with God. It places, the catechism places the emphasis on the choices, which is, which is not incorrect. There are other things, as I've suggested in our conversation, that go along with it. What I really like in particular to create, to reason, to love, what other creatures can create and reason in quite the way we can this is not to denigrate creation, but to talk about what it means to be in the image of God. Which in that the implication is to love as God loves and to create as God creates and to exactly. reason as God reasons. Exactly. And, and with that creation, right, comes the, as Cassie was saying, and as, as uh, Herbert argues, comes the ability to tear down. 
and, and looking and understanding what it means where we can create and build and love, we tend to view them as zero sum games. If I'm going to create something and build something, or I'm going to have something that I love, it means that you can't have it, or I have to tear down your thing. And of course, that's not, that's not the case, is it? Well, any other thoughts on this? So, um, as I said, this is a little different because in this case, we're just sort of entering into the text. It's there. This is just a good old fashioned close reading. And I think the thing is, the things are there for everyone to see. Uh, next week, though, um, the story of Rebecca and Jacob is a little more complicated um, and, and very engaging. So um, I encourage you, I'll bring passages again, but I encourage you, especially if you're not terribly familiar with it, to just read through Genesis 25 through 33. It, it won't take you terribly long to do so. Um, and it's, it's actually quite engaging stories. And, and if you, you know, um, one thing to do maybe is if you have a different formatted Bible, or if you just go to one of the websites and turn off the chapter and verse numbers, and read it like you've picked up a novel. Um, it's actually pretty decent literature, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and it is amazing when you, at least for me, and this is part of the challenge of growing up in, you know, in a church where we did pull apart, just like we've just done now all the time, is I had to go back and relearn how to read the Bible just straight through you know, a, any given section, as opposed to, in the beginning, okay, what does the beginning mean? You know, you got to read to the end of the sentence before you go back, right? So, any other closing thoughts or comments? I want to go back and just remind folks um, that's this is our schedule. This is what you know. I'm I'm looking to carry us through, but you know what? If you've got, um, I'm not going to give up Ruth and Naomi. They're some of my favorites. But if there are <laughs> any other any other figures or characters that you would like us to, to, to go in that you've always been like, I love Jephthah. I really want to talk about Jephthah. Great. Shoot me a note and we'll bump somebody else out. You know, I just want to thank you for taking your time because I know you're very busy to do this. It's excellent. Well, thank you. Elizabeth will tell you, I, I enjoy this stuff. So this is a lot of fun and joy for me. And so I have to thank you all for putting up with me because um, I, I, I do enjoy this. And I, this is actually one aspect of teaching I'm most passionate about. And as an administrator at the university, I don't get to do this sort of thing very often. So thank you, Anne. Thank you very much. Well, let us, um, let us end with a word of prayer and go in peace for our worship service. The Lord be with you. And also, also with, with you. you. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you that you have created us in your image, that you have empowered us to love and to create, to care for one another. And this time especially, we pray, Holy Spirit, to fill us so that we might see you in everyone around us, to recognize that we are all created in your image, that we all deserve your love, care, and protection. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you move powerfully through our society that you empower everyone, regardless of whether they know and call on your name, to recognize innately within each other the brilliant spark of life and light. We do not understand the Trinity, but we know that you are our God, that you have given us grace and salvation, and we pray now for peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. And um, yeah, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be, Thanks to, God. be to God. Bye, y'all. Bye.